morning, ladies and gentlemen. Great to have you with us, and a very good morning to everyone that's joining us online today. Fantastic to be with you. My name is Eleni Jokos. I'm an anchor and correspondent at CNN, and uh, we have a lot to get through today. We're going to be tackling, I guess, one of the toughest topics um, on hand and a big dilemma for many countries, how to prepare the green transition for fossil fuel exporters. Um, in preparation for this, and of course with the assistance of Diego, and I'll, I'll be introducing my panelists in just a little bit, here's an interesting fact. A quarter of the IMF members are net fossil fuel exporters. 80% are highly dependent fiscally or externally on fossil fuels. So the question now becomes, how do we see this transition? Um, how do we replace revenues? These are the big questions, big topic questions that we need to address. But this is really tied in with the supply-demand scenarios that are playing out, how much investment into renewable energy, how much we're actually seeing a lot of these economies diversify, and can fossil fuel income and revenues be replaced by other industries, specifically by cleaner and greener uh, energy technologies, um, a very vital point. So I'd like to welcome everyone. I've got Diego Mesa Puyo, uh, who is the Deputy Head of Climate Policy Division uh, at the IMF Fiscal Affairs Department. Welcome, Diego. Great to have you with us. Dr. Melissa Lott, a Senior Director of Research at the Center of Global uh, Energy Policy. Great to have you. And Fahad uh, Alajilan, uh, excuse me, Alajlan, uh, the president of King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center, uh, Cap Sark. Great to have you. Please, round of applause for my fantastic guest today. Um, one of the most important things that, of course, we need to look at, um, Fahad, I'm going to start with you, is supply demand. And we need to address this topic because you've been, uh, you know, you, you conduct your own oil market outlook um, and you've been assessing the future of hydrocarbons um, in the world. And you've been looking at some of these trends that are playing out or lack of trends. So tell me what you've discovered. So I'm um, happy to be here on this panel. Uh, our quarterly uh, oil market outlook basically looks at two years in the future. So we don't do the you know, 2050, 2060, 2100 that we see. Uh, but I think it's very important to distinguish between two things. And one is forecasts and the other is scenarios. Mm -hmm. And for example, the IEA net zero scenario is a scenario that says basically, if we want to reach net zero emissions by 2050, then what do we have to do? And it yeah. casts backward to today. Others that do differently, which is they look actually at the forecast. And, and we have done this. Uh, um, OPEC has done this. Exxon do, does that as well. PP and other forecasters. Um, also, the International Energy uh, uh, Economic Association of Japan does this. Uh, IEG Japan uh, published their uh, yearly outlook. It's a, it's a forecast. It's not yeah. a, a scenario. And basically, they have two forecasts. One is the reference case, and the other is the advanced technology, where I assume that you know, technology deployment will actually gain a lot of track between now and uh, 2050. And in their two scenarios, the reference case, they see oil demand increasing by 25% by 2050. In the, um, in the advanced technology deployment scenario, they see demand going down to around between 50 and 70 million barrel per day. Uh, today, we are about 103 million barrel per day. If we go to the IPCs scenario and we look at them, if we look at the scenario that are compliant with the Paris Agreement goals of you know, keeping global warming below uh, two degrees, then the range is even bigger. So by 2050, we see demands for oil going between 107 million and down to 23 million. So the ranges are high. I think the issues that we need to always distinguish is between what is forecasting and what is scenarios. Because I think it's very important that we are prepared for a multitude of you know, different scenarios. And like any corporation that would look at scenarios when they're doing their investments, oil and gas producers, but also consumers, need to do that as well. They look at a multitude of scenarios when they're looking and they're planning their you know, future demand and their future energy mix. Uh, and so it's very important that while we're seeing a lot of you know, growth, especially in renewables, uh, solar and wind, we have to still think that you know, over the past almost five decades, you know, the range of fossil fuel in the global energy mix hasn't changed dramatically. It's still above 80%. Yeah. 
And while we're seeing you know, significant growth, and again, I think that given the growth in energy demand, we have to be careful about what we do when we're talking about investment in oil and gas and coal. Very fascinating. Uh, just a note, we are waiting for Mary uh, Warleck from the International Energy Agency. She will be joining us shortly, who also has um, supply demand scenarios as well as forecasts that she could share with us, which I think will be really interesting because they're also doing a lot of work on this front. Um, a lot of interesting uh, points they've had. We'll get back to you in just a moment, but I want to bring in Dr. Lott. Um, welcome. Great to have you with us. Mm -hmm. um, Look, at the Centre on Global Energy Policy, you've been developing a lot of research uh, that addresses uh, the world's energy and climate problems. Speaking to what Fahad just set out, because we've got to you know, differentiate and delineate between forecasts and scenarios mm -hmm. and how that would play out. And, and frankly, it depends on what route we take on certain things, how much investment we're expecting. Um, give me a sense of what you're doing, and then importantly, how does that speak to what Fahad mentioned? Yes, yeah, so at the Center on Global Energy Policy, which is part of Columbia University, it's yeah. in the School of International and Public Affairs, but we don't just have scholars who do policy. We have economists and engineers, finance professionals and others. And so what we do is we look at all of these different scenarios, all these different forecasts, and we say, what are the different sets of goals that we have and what would informed policy look like in those goals? So for an example, if you wanted to achieve the IEA's net zero scenario is an example, just one, in a certain country, what are the types of policy implementation you'd need in order to have a high probability that you get those outputs you want to see? Okay. So if your goal was to bring down emissions, what would that take? And what are practical pathways forward in getting to whatever that goal is? So when we think about pathways to net zero, we see a couple different things. One, um, and it goes to your you know, staying at 80% of total fuel mix, which is our history is one of fuel additions, not transitions. We haven't stopped using anything, really, over our history. So today we use the same amount of wood around the world that we did in the 1800s. We have just kept adding more and more fuels. Now we're talking about bringing down the amount of individual fuels that we use, namely fossil fuels. So the question is, given all of the different priorities, because there are many, of which climate is a major one, but it's one of them, what do we think could happen in the future? And then what kind of policy actions would be needed in order to change that future to achieve different goals? So when it comes to these different scenarios, I'll just say um, I'm excited for our IEA colleague to join us. I used to work at the IEA. I remember running those models for those scenarios. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 10 years ago, if I wanted to look at future oil demand and what would actually bend that curve, just creating a scenario, I had to throw my figuratively, my whole body weight and a few friends on top of that to actually get it to bend. It was incredibly difficult. You had to make some, I don't know, assumptions that quite frankly didn't make a lot of sense. Today, when I run those same models, it feels like I breathe heavily in their direction and I see the wiggles starting to happen because of different pressures in the system. This is going to be a great conversation. <laughs> having so much fun. Um, Diego, um, I love the IMF because you guys come up with incredible research documents, you do a lot of fiscal monitors, and you really sort of delve deep into what you know, certain things could mean fiscally for nations. Um, your climate crossroads fiscal policies on, warming, uh, on a warming world. Um, based on your work and experience, also in Colombia as well, I, I want you to give me a sense on how this transition could be possible. And it's a pleasure to be here too. Thank you very much, Eleni. Uh, I think that's you know it's a, it's a great question that we're trying to to tackle, especially for fossil fuel exporters going yeah. forward. Uh, I think what we've heard here is that there's going to be a lot of uncertainty going forward, and policymakers have to deal with that uncertainty uh, to base the decisions that they're going to be making, uh, because the transition means, especially for fossil fuel exporters, that there's going to be a lot of pressure on revenue side and also on the export side. And the question is how to prepare for that in the face of this you know, higher uncertainty. I think a lot of fossil fuel exporters have been used to a lot of volatility on the price side. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of volatility uh, and uh, them thinking how to you know, adjust the fiscal policies to be able to actually accommodate that volatility. Now I think what we know uh, despite the fact that we don't know uh, what scenario is going to play out, is that eventually they may face an actual decline that is going to be permanent uh, on fossil fuel demand. And 
how you're going to prepare for that permanent decline. So, you know, from the physical uh, point of view, which you mentioned, the physical monitor, uh, uh, we need to think about, you know, how we can encourage these countries to, for example, uh, do better in physical discipline. And by fiscal discipline, we mean you know, setting up, for example, medium-term fiscal frameworks uh, that they also have um, credible uh, and formal fiscal rules, that they have independent fiscal councils. And this is something that we've already seen in a lot of fossil fuel exporters, including in the GCC region, but also in South America. Colombia yeah. has you know, a very credible fiscal rule. Uh, and then you need to think about how to manage the existing revenues and the revenues are going to continue to accumulate as you continue the transition. And you know, what to do with the revenues? Do you want to maybe use it to promote uh, new growth sectors? Do you want to use it to lower taxes in some of uh, other uh, you know, industries? Uh, do you want to use to repay debt if you are highly indebted and until you know, at least the interest rate that you get on your assets is higher than the interest rate that you get on the borrowing. So there's a, you know, a lot of decisions that need to be made, and we're trying to help our member countries to think about this carefully, taking into account that every country has a unique situation. But does it hinge on one thing, though, if Ahad can maybe weigh in on this? Because, again, I'm going to repeat this. 80% of our energy right now is from fossil fuels, right? It's 80%. And you're talking about models and bending the, you know, the... the, 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 the exactly. Yeah. So, and th this is the thing. This will really only work if oil and fossil fuel demand is suppressed, right, comes under pressure, and then essentially you're forced into a transition or your transition that puts pressure on fossil fuel demand, and therefore we have an alternative. Right, Fahad? I think definitely policy is one of the major things that when it comes to projecting oil demand, oil and gas demand and fossil fuel. I think policy is one thing, technology is another thing. I think um, if you look back 10 years ago, we, nobody expected that you know, uh, electric cars would actually gain as much and it was only one company, Tesla, that started this. So I think technology and the state of technology is important. But I think at the same time that we think about this, um, there are technologies that could help oil and gas demand. Uh, for example, hydrogen. If hydrogen costs would come down and we're seeing more penetration of hydrogen, that might, means more demand for, for gas, for example, uh, if you're thinking about blue hydrogen. Uh, the same thing if the cost of abatement comes down, CCUS and direct air capture, that might mean that the cost of abatement for those fuels might come down and that might actually help in increasing them and increasing the demand, the potential demand. It doesn't mean that demand is going to go up through the roof. I think uh, what we have seen is over the past few decades, we've seen the examples of China, which is you know, a country that developed miraculously fast. But we're seeing now, even that the, you know, China is the, one of the largest energy consumer and the biggest oil importer, we're seeing that demand has almost plateaued. And we're seeing this issue of energy intensity and energy productivity. The more the economy develops, the less energy it needs as it develops more of the value-adding sectors and relies less on the heavy industry sector. So these are the, some of the things that are important for us uh, when we look at the projection of oil and gas demand. So both policy and technology will play a role. So basically what we want to see, right, um, Melissa, is a plateauing of demand right now yeah, for oil and gas. Until we sort out demand for oil and gas, supply is be there. Supply is responding to demand. If it doesn't have a home, exactly. you're not going to produce yeah. it. And that's how that works. So the question is, and it's exactly the point you said, which is how quickly do new technologies diffuse? And also within that, it's not just about technologies replacing technologies on the ground. You can talk about existing car fleets as one example, or existing industrial load. But what does the future car fleet in places that don't have those fleets yet, how does that develop? And I. I do not like to use the term leapfrog because there is so much weight behind that word. What I will say is it's more, we have options today that we did not have 50, 100 years ago. And so countries that are in that emerging economy space, the decisions they make will have huge impacts on how these numbers look moving forward. Yeah. In addition to how quickly we transition in places where we do already have lots of cars, lots of chemicals, lots of other things. Super fascinating. Did you want to weigh in, Fahad? Yeah, I think, um, it's very difficult to tell because the last few years has been, you know, yeah. uh, because of COVID, we cannot actually tell the signal of where oil and gas demand. I think for gas, we definitely see more growth, at least in the next 10 to 15 years. I think with oil, it's a, it's a little bit difficult to understand and see where it's going. But given the robust, you know, um, growth that we have seen since COVID, 
and even during the depth of COVID, that you know, when the world was you know, put at standstill, the demand reduced by almost 10 million barrel only, it tells us that the world, I think, is still needs you know, oil and gas, at least in the short term, medium term, before it, it transitions. Yeah, I just want to touch on, on, on a point because we've mentioned two things that are critical here for this discussion. And one is that we need to have, you know, big technology changes, but also behavioral changes, right? And the question for us at the IMF is, what do you do from the policy point of view to be able to, you know, channel those changes uh, in, in all the countries? So uh, we need to think about how to you know, price correctly some of the externalities uh, from fossil fuel consumption. And, you know, you've probably listened to our managing director over the last uh, uh, few days here. Uh, we are big advocates of carbon pricing. And we think that, you know, addressing this issue for fossil fuel producers also in their domestic economies will help them prepare uh, for the future. So, uh, you know, removing or phasing out completely fossil fuel subsidies is absolutely key. We just published a report that estimates that explicit subsidies worldwide in 2022 were up to 1.3 trillion US dollars, wow. right? And then we need to think about how we implement policies, uh, not only carbon pricing, but other policies from the fiscal point of view that will help, you know, get these technologies on a level playing field so that we can see much bigger adoption uh, globally. That, I mean, 1.33 trillion US dollars, oil subsidies. 1.3, only explicit, explicit subsidies, which mean you're charging less for the fossil fuel products than what they actually cost to extract. If you were to add implicit subsidies, which is, you know, the cost of environmental damages, global warming, health, congestion, and so forth, then our estimates are up to 7 trillion U.S. dollars so in 2022. On. So this is this is purely a policy decision. Correct. This is policy. Correct. Are we unwinding these policies? Uh, that, that's, that's a lot of countries. I think that's one of the main goals here, and that's what we've been telling countries: you need to phase out fossil fuel subsidies, at least explicitly. Let's, we need to begin with that. Well, and so far, our decision has been mainly to add other subsidies to other things, not to unwind the subsidies we have. Yeah. So we've actually been doubling down on subsidies within the system. And, and I think the key is better targeting. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. you may have some vulnerable households and maybe even 100%. some sectors of the economy that need some support, but you need to do a better job at targeting the subsidies. And it's going to be obviously much cheaper yeah. for uh, the countries and help them prepare for what's uh, coming next. Mary Warlick from the International Energy Agency. Great to have you with us. Nice to see you again. Apologies Thank you so for much my for being late. Excuse it's okay. Me. Lots of important meetings happening. Yes. I hope you solved global problems uh, in these meetings. No, we're just <laughs> trying to play our small part. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, every part is important. Yeah. Great to have you with us. Um, and we've, we're talking about supply demand, how countries will be impacted, um, and then obviously what does the transition actually mean? And we also spoke about the fact that the um, energy mix is still very reliant on oil and gas, it's still 80%. So the IEA um, has been doing, does a lot, obviously on supply demand scenarios and forecasts. Give me a sense of what you're seeing right now. Well, thanks very much. You're right that we um, have issued a couple of reports recently. Our flagship annual report, the World Energy Outlook, took a close look at uh, developments in the um, fossil fuel sector, as did uh, our most recent report we released, which has to do with the role of the oil and gas industry in contributing to net zero goals by 2050. And uh, in the WIO, in the World Energy Outlook, um, our analysis there does show, uh, based on the current trends and largely due to the significant uptick in investments in the clean energy technologies, that uh, we uh, foresee a, a peaking of um, all fossil fuels, uh, coal, oil, and gas, by 2030. Now, the drop-off between 2030 and 2050 in the coal sector is more significant, uh, I think along the lines of 40% uh, by 2050, but less so in the case of the oil and gas uh, sectors, uh, where um, uh, reliance uh, will still be and demand will still be uh, quite high. So there's definitely, uh, for us, and this takes me to just say a couple of words about our report on the oil and gas sector in, uh, in, in net zero, is, uh, is the role that this industry itself can play in trying to uh, reduce emissions and, uh, and also in playing its part in terms of investments in the clean energy sector. Um, 
only about that the oil and gas sector uh, writ large only contributes about one percent to total clean energy uh, supply globally, and uh, and across and, and within the industry, only about 2.5 percent of capex is devoted to clean energy. So, um, yeah, if you're going to come back to these yeah, questions, sorry, I just want I to, 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 to go back words. to that point yeah. that that peak oil and gas that oil and gas demand will peak in 2030. Right? Yes, correct. In yes. 2030. That is good news. But I mean, in terms of the numbers, do you see that our reliance on oil and gas, will, will the numbers stay the same, that it's going to be 80% of our energy mix? Are uh, you seeing not, that Not move? 80%, but the degree to which it will decline very much depends on yeah. both uh, decisions made by the industry, but also very much, of course, on continued significant accelerated investments in uh, clean energy technology yeah. and uh, uh, moving forward. Fantastic. Fahad, um, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. um, an important oil and gas producer, right? Um, and, and we know the revenues, the, the, the revenues are absolutely vital. I also know, I've been covering Saudi Arabia for the last few years, you're really aggressively trying to diversify your economy. It's a simple question, you know, whether investing in other industries can truly make up for the losses in revenue in fossil fuels. So uh, I'll, I'll try to answer it, but I'll also try to give numbers. Um, Vision 2030 was launched in 2016, and in the year before, uh, in 2015, 90% uh, of the uh, revenues for the, oil, for the government budget came from oil. Uh, for this year budget, it's about 50%, almost, you know, just to give rough numbers. So there has been significant progress in diversification of funding resources for the government. When it comes to the economy, I think we've seen over the past few years investments in other sectors, including tourism, technology, manufacturing, and others. I think we have seen good progress. I think there is still room to continue. Uh, but I think the, the, the vision thinks of that, and I think we have at CAPSOC looked at um, what is the expected impact of those reforms. And what we have found is that actually by 2030, the um, Saudi economy's uh, you know, resilience to oil shock is going to increase by 77%. So it shows that the Saudi economy is actually moving away from being reliant on uh, oil and gas sector for both economic as well as, you know, revenues. It's still going to be an important sector, but it's not going to be um, the make or fall of the Saudi budget or the Saudi economy. And it's still going to be an important sector. It will be important. And this sector. is the realistic approach that we keep hearing. We need to be realistic and pragmatic. Yes. About, yes. So I, I will just make maybe one point as well. And uh, I think Diego talked about, you know, the explicit and the implicit oil subsidies. Mm -hmm. I, I just find that one of the implicit subsidies that are, or, uh, that are ad added by the IMF are congestion and road damage. And for me, that is the same between a nice vehicle or an AV. So I don't see how is this a fossil fuel subsidy. It, we might call it a subsidy to motorists, to private car owners, but I don't see it as a fossil fuel subsidy. It's a, I, think, I think it's a, it's a good point, and I think the, what we're trying to tell here is that if you subsidize fossil fuel consumption, you're going to promote more driving than what actually needs to take place, and you're not going to incentivize, for example, mass transportation systems, which are cleaner, especially if they're run uh, on electricity, like a lot of the metros. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good discussion about you know, what's yeah. included and what's not. So you want to make and it more expensive for me, <laughs> <laughs> as the poor consumer, Right? So I have a problem getting I, to work and making my life more expensive. I get you, Diego. Yeah, no, I, I, you. I, I want you to be conscious. And I'm very conscious. Pricing, <laughs> pricing <laughs> and the real externalities, right? Yeah, I know. Uh, and, and and I, and I, if I can, I just want one the additional point to, the, to what uh, Fahad said, that we agree. Obviously, we're going to continue to uh, demand fossil fuels for a lot of the hard to evade sectors yeah. uh, in, the, in the near to medium term. It'd be also very good to make sure that we reduce the footprint of extraction activity, transportation activity. And I think there was a big announcement here uh, in this COP about methane. 
uh, and you know how we yeah. can reduce methane in the future and then methane fees and, and something that is actually an economic incentive for fossil fuel uh, exporters to make sure that we use this methane natural gas in an efficient way. So I just wanted to yeah. add that it's good to lower the footprint as well of uh, fossil fuel production, yeah. transportation, distribution, etc. Exactly, also, and there's lots of amazing clean tech on that. Yeah. yeah, there's just one comment on this as well though. In the implicit subsidy around internal combustion engines, when you analyze it, we also do have to take into account other types of air pollution. Greenhouse gas emissions are one of them. If you take a, I guess, I'm just gonna take a Euro 6 standard car, we'll just make a pretty efficient car. Um, when it comes to particulate matter, when you go from your internal combustion engine to yeah. an electric vehicle, even with the increased weight of that vehicle, you will still decrease your particulate matter by about half, but you will eliminate your nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds. So within this, like there is, it's not one for one. There no, is a I difference agree. between the two. Uh, okay. I just disagree just on the on congestion it. and the road damage as being implicit fossil fuel subsidy. And I'm saying the impacts of congestion when I'm idling my electric vehicle are quite different than when I'm idling a fossil fuel internal combustion engine. That's all I just wanted to clarify. Who on, owns so. an electric vehicle yeah. here? What's that? I who own an electric owns, vehicle. Who owns an internal con combustion engine, ICE vehicle? Yeah? <laughs> uh, audience, can I ask you a question, please? By show of hand, who owns an electric vehicle in this room? Wow. Everyone else, internal combustion engine? Some yeah. of us bike to work. <laughs> Bike to work. Yeah, because you can. I can't do that in Dubai. I'm going to either die of the heat or... <laughs> Isn't that fascinating, Mary? Yes, yes. And it's interesting because our analysis shows that uh, in this year, one in five vehicles uh, being uh, uh, manufactured and sold is an electric vehicle. Um, just uh, in 2020, just a few years ago, it was one in 25. So yeah. we're, we are moving in the right direction, but I guess it's not quite represented yet. But it's also a price here. point thing, right? It's also yes. a pri price point issue. I mean, mm -hmm. I see someone nodding in the audience. Yes. It's a price point price issue. Price point and infrastructure. Um, it's a vehicle financing issue it's, as yeah. well. It's so, different cost. So Mary, I have a question for you. Um, you know, I grew up in a coal mining town in South Africa, in uh, Emalakhleni. And South Africa's got major issues on electricity production. Let's not get into that, but they are shutting down some coal-fired power plants that are aging, and they're also shutting down some coal mines. Upon visiting these communities where I grew up, they're saying they're going to replace it with renewable energy jobs. That's not happening. It's not happening fast enough. There's a gap. And also the jobs are not correlated. The, the number of jobs are not correlated that you know, were available in coal mining to uh, renewable energy. So the, I guess the question becomes, for all fossil fuel producers, what is the reality of really trying to transition, thinking about the socioeconomically, but also from a revenue perspective? Well, I think, um, you know, one of the points that we um, emphasize a lot um, as part of our analysis and in our discussions is the importance of international collaboration, private sector, public sector, and so on. And certainly I do think that this is an area where the fossil fuel industry does have an important role to play. That is the whole subject of, you know, people-centered and inclusive transitions. And as uh, the companies in this sector begin to move, those who do decide to, and hopefully it will be many of them begin to move into more investments in clean energy technologies, um, that they also take on board some of the um, important uh, issues related to um, skills, uh, retraining, and investment in communities where um, there are there are such losses, and there's no obviously one size fits all. It's a it's a, it's a set of issues that we're working on and trying to collaborate with lots of stakeholders on um, in a, within the IEA. But it's really I think a responsibility, as I said, for many stakeholders to be be playing their part in. But we can agree it's not easy. It's not no, this linear. Not no, it's you know, not easy gym. because in many cases the areas, of course, where uh, new investments are made may not correlate with the yeah. geographic areas where the coal mines are. Um, uh, nevertheless, um, I think there are some good examples out there of communities that have, uh, that have been able to work through these transitions by attracting investments in other areas, but it does require very concerted um, policy. Melissa, um, sorry, the, the, Melissa, your, your colleagues have written about the new energy order, how governments will transform energy markets, mm -hmm. how governments will transform em energy markets. And governments have yeah. a big role in setting up market yeah. rules. So how do the market rules work? 
How do they work today? How do we want to work in the future? There's a huge role for government in that. And the decisions they make will have big cascading impacts. Right now, the markets are set up to, when you look at what our markets are doing, it's very logical when you break it down, given the rules at play. Actors are behaving how you would expect them to behave, given the structures that they are engaging in. So I'm supplying oil because there's a demand for oil and there's a market for me to sell it in a certain way that doesn't price certain things, but prices other things. It, it makes a ton of sense. So if we want to talk about our markets, they were designed for the last 50 years, the last 100 years. There have been reforms in different parts of the world and in different international cases along the way. But it's not fit for purpose for what we're trying to do in the future. Just like, and I will come back to this, I do a lot of work on the equitable transition. And when we talk about replacing, even going from a steel manufacturing plant that has one process to another process, so going from blast furnaces to electric arc furnaces, you will change the composition of the workforce. And most of the people who will get left behind in that are people who drive trucks, people who move yeah. heavy things around. They don't have a role naturally in that next step. So the question is, from a community standpoint, from an equity and justice standpoint, what are you actively doing? And there's potentially a role for government there as well. And when I talk to communities, to be quite frank, they're like, great, I get these global numbers. What does it mean for me? Yes. What does it mean for my children, my parents, my neighbor, my community? And my community could be 50 people, it could be 5,000 people, it could be bigger than that. In New York City, 5,000 people is like one apartment block, so you know, but it's, it's all these different things and I don't, it's not that I don't care about the global number, but I want to understand what it means for me and what are we actively doing to make sure that my priorities and my community are included in this equation. In the models, we, we don't consider that, like it's not a forcing Yeah, because no function. one should be left behind. This is going to be a big bumpy transition. That's another misnomer that I, We'll see if we agree on this. When it comes to modeling and scenarios, I'm looking at my fellow scenario people, we draw beautiful, straight, smooth lines. It is anything but smooth in a transition. They are incredibly bumpy and they look very different at a local level. And so the question is, what are we going to do to actually facilitate a transition? Diego, let's talk about physical policies Thank that can help agree. mitigate the effects okay. of this energy transition that we're, we're talking about. Yes. Can, you, can the IMA fix it for us? <laughs> <laughs> so, as, as I said before, I think it's going to be dependent on the specific characteristics of each country. Okay. Uh, when we take some of the scenarios uh, that the IEA does, uh, uh, that we hear from Mary here, uh, you know, we look at what's the impact on uh, fossil fuel explorers. You said at the beginning, you know, that uh, about a quarter of the IMF membership uh, is a net fossil fuel exporter, and about 80% of them depend heavily on the fiscal side and on external account. And when we say heavily, is you know, on the external account, anywhere between 5% to 40% of total exports come wow. from this sector. And on the fiscal side, now that we're talking about fiscal policies, uh, it could be up to 90%. Right. So, but then the impact is going to be uh, differentiated based on a number of different characteristics. So, whether you actually are a very cost-effective, uh, extractive country. Uh, obviously, we're in a region here in which they have a competitive advantage because it's much uh, efficient to extract oil here. They're going to be better off than other countries in which it's going to be more costly. Uh, second, I think another question is, uh, what's the carbon intensity of your actual industry? And what can you do from a fiscal point of view to actually lower that? So already talk about uh, methane fees. Uh, and then uh, you need to talk about how diversified these economies are. Obviously, those who are less diversified are going to be more severely impacted than those who are already diversifying the economies. And we already heard uh, some of the great things that Saudi Arabia has been doing, for example. So here, I think, uh, you know, with the fiscal policy and I think more general and structural policies, uh, to be able to diversify the tax base, to be able to grow new sectors, uh, to be able to get new employment, uh, and even going to a local community, what Melissa was saying, you know, we can promote uh, active labor market policies in which the government actually provides a lot of support to not only retrain, retool, reskill, but also to find jobs uh, and do job search. So I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, roles for the government, and especially on the fiscal policy, to help uh, countries navigate the transition. So someone that's in the thick of things is, of course, Fahad, because you're, you're weighing all of this up. This is now your reality. This is your new reality where you have to make it work. So uh, I just have to maybe distinguish between, you know, fossil fuel exporters. I think. We have fossil fuel exporters, um, like countries in the GCC, has, that has built a lot of state capacity and has invested in education. I think we have other who has not done as well. And I think 
again, not that you know, those countries will not be affected, but they will not be affected equally. And some of those states, especially in the GCC, has established sovereign wealth funds, some intergenerational funds that can help them manage the energy transition. I think other countries has not done as well. And so even when we're looking at the next phase of investment in the energy transition and in renewables, hydrogen, and others, we're seeing less capacity in some countries than other. And I think countries like the GCC will be able to better manage the energy transition. I think when it comes to um, you know, the way that we see it, we see the GCC and especially Saudi Arabia as you know, the last man standing when it comes to oil production. And so we can talk about you know, oil You'll demand. You'll be the last oil producer <laughs> in the world. I think so, given the reserve yeah. and given the cost and given the carbon intensity. We go back to what Diego. I think going forward, carbon intensity is going to be important. So how clean is your barrel? And so um, just maybe to plug in some of the work that we have done at Capsarc, uh, we just published a report yesterday on methane emissions that are coming from the uh, oil and gas sector in Saudi Arabia. And we're doing, starting to do this for the GCC and the MENA as well. And what we have discovered is using satellite technology, which is not perfect, but we feel it's very good, uh, that actually um, methane emissions coming from the oil and gas sector are almost 73% less than what is being reported by the IEA. And so we're seeing significant, I think, numbers in, in, in countries that have done actually uh, enough. I think the IEA methodology is focused on the US, and then they adjust it for other countries. And so that's why we're seeing some discrepancies in methane emission. But our work, which we have done for Saudi, and then the next two months, we'll publish for the GCC, and then hopefully by the next COP, we're going to expand it to the MENA yeah. region. We're going to show how satellite technology can be effective. And I think this is one of the things that are very important when it comes to you know, MMIV, how we can measure and, and report and verify emissions for all countries, whether producers or consumers. But it's very important that we account for those emissions and we can actually measure them and then make you know, progress against reducing those emissions. Well, luckily, we've got Mary with us. <laughs> so I, I have to respond here. Yes. And I'd be delighted to introduce you to our modelers so you can understand perhaps in a little more detail just how rigorous they are and the approach that they take. So I have to very much uh, defend uh, the case there. No, look, I think, um, you know, there is, uh, there's, there's a lot to be done. There's no question. And our purpose in putting out a report, as we did on the royal, uh, role of the oil and gas, industry and meeting net zero was, I think, simply to, to, to really underscore just the importance of um, yeah, all sectors of the economy. And yes, this one in particular uh, playing its part for so many reasons. The resources that it has available, as I said, only 2.5% of CapEx globally on the part of oil and gas companies is put into clean energy technologies. There's so much that this sector can also do to contribute uh, to the development of the important clean energy technologies, uh, including um, the sort of low emissions fuel and hydrogen and CCUS, all these kinds of technologies where you already are, as you indicated, quite uh, invested and really can, I think, help to unlock some of the remaining technology challenges that remain for the hard to abate sectors. So there's this important role, I think, of partnership in helping to really scale up and, and, and further the progress that you're mentioning, which is never a straight line. You're absolutely right. It's dependent on so many factors. Above all, the question of, of investment, right? And sort of, um, you know, coming back to, um, I think, an sort of indirect point you were making um, uh, on, uh, on, on and uh, emerging and developing economies, scaling up the investment in clean energy uh, technologies and investment in this part of the world is going to be so, so crucial going forward. So, um, yeah, and just back to the one more point on, on emissions. Yes, um, very encouraging to see the number of companies and entities that are coming on board uh, with our uh, recommendation uh, for a 75% reduction in methane and reduction from the oil and gas. Uh, industry sector we, uh, in, in pr from production. We believe that's quite doable, but in addition to that, um, setting an ambitious uh, target of reducing 60% uh, of scope one and scope two emissions by 2030 would also be a, a great contribution as well. So again, um, yeah, really, really appreciate the 
discussion yeah, on this it's really fantastic. important topic. So I'm just going to be blunt at this point because I feel like I have to. Okay, I speak to a lot of oil um, and gas CEOs, um, and of course they're not oil majors anymore, they're energy companies. Remember that, that change, right? They're energy companies. There is a big hesitation to truly get out of oil and gas because there's a view that we can clean up the industry, right? We can make it less um, carbon intensive or, you know, be, be at least cleaner. But it just, every time I go to the supermarket, I don't know if you have this moment, whenever you buy shampoo, whenever you buy anything that's in a box or plastic, it's all connected to the oil industry. All of us. I mean, we, our, our lives are, are just completely bound up by this industry. We, we can't get away from it. Even if we try and change our behavior, it's just, it's not gonna work. It's impossible. Um, are we matching the urgency of the climate crisis? We've come off the hottest year with what we're seeing on the policy front and what we're seeing on the modeling front and what we're seeing from the fossil fuel producers to really say, look, we're matching the urgency on the climate situation because it feels like we're still trying to make decisions on wording at this point. Uh, I, think, I think progress has been made. And uh, when you look at the ambition of the countries and the policies that are being implemented, definitely uh, from the IMF, we see progress. And you know, we, we publish a lot of reports on this. But we do acknowledge that more needs to be done. Absolutely. But quickly. And quickly, yeah. And especially in, in this discussion, uh, you know, if things are delayed further, then obviously the changes are going to be much more drastic and may impact uh, especially fossil fuel exporters uh, in, in a more acute way. So, so I think, you know, there's progress uh, that we would like to see more, but we also see, and we didn't touch and probably we don't have time, but a lot of uh, changes, positive changes, for example, national companies uh, that are diversifying as well their operations. Uh, you know, I can sp speak about the example in Colombia. We see, for example, national company now uh, getting into uh, electricity transmission, which, you know, they believe is going to be critical as you try to bring cleaner sources yeah. of uh, uh, energy from parts that are far away from urban centers. So I, th I think, you know, progress has been made, but yes, definitely we need to do more. And for the policy side, you know, we're ready to continue to help countries uh, implement in this policies that we think will contribute to uh, net zero and uh, decarbonization. We've got a few minutes left. Yeah. We're going to get comments from everyone. Okay, so Melissa. we've increased our ambition. We haven't made those ambitions anywhere close to reality yet. Yeah. Um, and even the ambitions are not yet where we want them to be. So we need to close that gap. And within that, there's a lot of clarity that needs to be provided on many levels. I'll mention just really briefly um, an article that my boss put out in the New York Times, oh, several months ago. And he said, you know, there's a lot of talk about all these ambitions, but in reality, let's look at, I think it was BP when they announced they were kind of rolling back some of their transition plans, they got rewarded by the market. They got rewarded, they got paid for that, they got a bump, they got a bonus. Like That shows you that there's still a disconnect. So when we look at the barriers to the transition, I would argue that it is almost entirely not technology, and I'm an engineer, I love me tech, okay, I do. But it's not that. It's all the non-technical things that still are aligned to allow us to accelerate the transition as quickly as the climate science says we need to. If you look at the latest IPCC report, the things we thought wouldn't happen until 1.5 or 1.8 degrees are happening now. now. Yeah, happening and now. And when we think about tipping points, those are big. And so the costs only go up the more we delay. But without clarity, back to what I said earlier, folks are behaving very logically and rationally given the rules of the, the whole system right now. So I think um, for a fossil fuel exporter, they definitely need to do more, especially in you know, reducing the emissions of the oil and gas sector. So committing to net zero for their oil and gas sectors, making sure they reduce emissions, including methane, flaring, uh, but also cleaning up using electrification uh, in their own operation to you know, reduce emissions. And then finally, using available technology for carbon removal to show the way. I think it's very important to actually lead by example and show that you have, you know, you're invested in actually making and committing the, to this energy transition. Mary. Just a couple last statistics. I just think it's important, as you would all understand better than I, that um, there's a real diversity of companies across the oil and gas uh, sector and the hydrocarbons industry, right? So um, majors, then we often talk about the majors, you just mentioned one of them, only represent 13% of total um, oil and gas production globally. 
It's the national oil companies who represent the far, by far the biggest share, over 50%, and then there are many thousands of other small independent producers as well. So um, I think that uh, there, there is an important sort of government industry role to play there in helping uh, to, um, to really um, yeah, um, move, move the needle on, uh, on, the, on, on both the uh, emissions reduction side as well as the investment in the clean energy um, uh, production and technologies going forward. And again, I think for us, it's really a uh, very uh, international partnership and partnership across uh, public and private uh, sectors is going to be really important to make some real headway here. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to steal a couple more minutes. I've got, to, I've got a question. It's the same question, but I'm just going to put phrase it differently. I'm going to put it in a different context. We're waiting for the communique, the final communique of COP28 next week. We've got the draft. We know it's all about the wording. Um, realistically, as we have these discussions, phase out of oil and gas or fossil fuel, phase out or phase down? So phase out, hands up. Who's for phase out? Two, three, okay, a few. Phase down, everyone else, yeah? Okay, now I'm gonna ask you in a different context. We've come off the hottest year. We're probably going to hit the tipping point, as Melissa was alluding to next year. We know that what we did 30 years ago is probably going to, we're gonna pay the price in the next few years. Phase out or phase down? So phase down? Still no one, okay. No one's got climate anxiety, this is fascinating. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you so much. A round of applause for my fantastic panelists. Thank you. Thank you.